Dr. Nadeau, thank you so much for joining me today. I am thrilled to have an opportunity to chat with you. Well, it, it's my pleasure, and I'm I'm just so struck whenever I um, am being interviewed by someone about women with ADHD. What what a community we have, you know, that it just turns into a very engaged chat because that's right. what we're like. <laughs> I know it. It never fails to amaze me. I've been doing this for three years, and I still. I feel like every person after one hour of conversation is like my bestie, like near and dear to my heart. And I will see, you know, I was just at the ADHD conference in November or at the end of November in Baltimore. And I saw, you know, guests from two years, three years ago that I hadn't talked to since then. And we just embraced each other like long lost family. And it's so funny to, and it's so nice because not only is it the friendliest community I've ever been a part of, but so many of us, myself included, really struggle with friendships and socializing, especially Especially with other women. And so for me, just to be able to like be friends on our own terms <laughs> in the way that we are friends, I think is is such a wonderful community to be a part of. But but isn't that interesting that all of us women with ADHD who may have felt throughout our lives like we didn't quite fit in just immediately click with one another. And there are so many of us that, you know, I, I think we, we just need to have some sort of tribal identification. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, okay, so now, so to get started, I would love to hear about your diagnosis journey, because you are not the first psychologist, certainly not the first psychologist I've interviewed who was diagnosed after already working so much with the population. And But you weren't necessarily drawn to ADHD clients. You were kind of thrown into it. Isn't that correct? <laughs> working with children? Well, yes and no. I, I was thrown into it in the sense that I had a general psychology practice, and then a very important public law uh, was passed in 1978 that basically mandated that kids with an ADHD diagnosis had to be given accommodations in school. And suddenly my phone was ringing off the hook. And that was so long ago that we still thought it was hyperactive little boys. Mm -hmm. And so... And so it it certainly wasn't a passion of mine to spend my career working with hyperactive little boys. I mean, those were just, you know, desperate moms calling me on the phone. Of course, I wanted to help them. And I think what really hooked me was talking with all those moms. Mm. Because, of course, those were the days when we didn't really think girls had it. You know, there was an occasional outlier uh, that might, but it was mostly boys, and it certainly wasn't adults. I mean, we, we just didn't know much of anything about it. But from the very beginning, the minute I started talking about moms, they started telling me um, how many of the same characteristics they had had as a child. and. They didn't know if they really had ADHD or not, because, you know, in those days, it was all very skeptical. But but I I think it just kind of grew on me, and, and it grew on me because my family is certainly impacted by ADHD. Uh, my daughter, uh, very unusually, was diagnosed just casually by her pediatrician at the age of four. And... He, you know, he just sort of, I took her in for a general physical and he said, your daughter has ADHD. And I went, what? And it was because she was this skinny little kid and she had tiny little bruises all over her legs because she kept climbing trees and falling out of them and bumping into the corners of tables. And, and she was swinging her legs and fidgeting around on the exam table. She said, yes, your daughter has has ADHD, and I knew that my younger brother did because he was he was the classic kid. I mean, he hated school, and he was rambunctious and impulsive and very lovable guy. But he and school just never meshed 
very much. And I was a good student and I liked school. So in those days, no one would have ever guessed, including myself, that I might have it too. Yeah. So, so um, I'm curious, what was it when you were talking to the, some of the mothers um, about their journey or about their children, what was it that you saw in yourself that you started to recognize was that was ADHD in, in, in how it presented in you? Well, I guess what I would say is that there was not an aha moment, but just a gradual unfolding because that was a time when I was really thinking not so much about women with ADHD or about myself, but it just became so clear to me that we don't outgrow this thing because I'm working with all these parents you know, who are telling me I was just like that. And, you know, I still am to a certain extent. And so that was my focus was adult ADHD. And I wasn't particularly focused on myself. But the more I worked with these families, the more I thought about my own family, then I started going back and looking. I mean, I'm exactly I was exactly the kind of girl that would never have been diagnosed. Um, I wasn't a behavioral problem never got in trouble in school. I did my homework. I was a straight A student, you know, just the kind of girl that never gets diagnosed. Uh, but because I was a bright kid, um, I entered college two years early into a special program that Emory University had. So I was 16 years old um, when I started college. And then thinking back about once I was away from my family and on my own, I was constantly misplacing things and constantly not remembering to fill up paperwork and turn it in. And looking back, I um, you know, was going to school in Atlanta and my roommate dropped me off at the airport to fly home for spring break. I'd never flown by myself in my life uh, at that point. And I thought, oh, I'm going to wander around the airport. You know, uh, the Atlanta airport is massive. It's one of the biggest airports in the world. And buy some presents to take home. And I got all involved in it, completely lost track of the time and missed my plane. Uh, and had to spend the night in the Atlanta airport. It was the last plane out. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe that's a sign that... <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's fascinating to me how many women I've interviewed who were diagnosed late, who were diagnosed in adulthood, but they had a sibling who was diagnosed, usually a brother, or even not diagnosed with ADHD, but was diagnosed with maybe a learning disability, and they adopted the identity of the easy sibling. You know, they were the ones who became, you know, um, the, you're the really good student. And, you know, much of those qualities we see a lot in girls, which is, you know, very bright, doing well, will, really well behaved. But then suddenly, as they get into adulthood, realizing how much they've been white knuckling it, how much perfectionism and anxiety have driven them in order to sort of be that good girl, right? Even into adulthood and how that was kind of how I recognized the ADHD in my daughter was she didn't, you know, she's very similar to many of the women I've interviewed who, um, she's 16 now, but you know, very bright, always did really, really well in school, but it was the, it's the anxiety and, um, the pressure to succeed that she puts on herself that I, I now recognize is such a, such a common quality in, in sure. women with ADHD. And I was like, oh, okay, that's also what it looks like. Exactly. Although I think I was so fortunate that wasn't my story. And I didn't go through life with anxiety. And so I, I was between two brothers. So I wasn't the golden child, the smartest one. My older brother literally was brilliant. I mean, he, he, they didn't know what to do with him. He was so smart. And so there was no pressure on me. I mean, I was just reasonably smart. He was boy genius. So that took all the pressure off of me. That's funny. I and had a, other, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, and I was just going to say, I also had the very good fortune of having a very laid back mother. 
I mean, so she was not after me, uh, you know, you forgot this or that she wasn't that way at all. I think she, she, I know she'd been raised by a very strict mother who had been a school teacher and sort of she took her mothering job very much like she took her school teacher job. And, and so she grew up determined, I'm not going to be that kind of mom. And I think I really benefited from it so that I didn't go around worried that I was going to make a mistake. Although, interestingly, this very non-critical mother I had the good fortune to be raised by, when I was in my 30s, we were in my kitchen. She was visiting and we were just chatting. And she said just kind of quietly, you know, you've gotten a lot more organized. And she never told me I was disorganized. I mean, mm. I, I wasn't criticized. You know, it was just this quiet observation. Mm, you know, you're sort of starting to get it together now. Oh, gosh. You know, it's funny. Um, I had a very similar experience in, just in terms of having, I had two older brothers, both of whom did very well in school, Ivy League scholarships, uh, you know, straight A's. And I was kind of the misfit that my mother didn't know what to do with. But my my parents also, I think they felt like they lucked out with the other two. So they didn't really put pressure on me. <laughs> they were kind of like, yeah, it's fine. Um, and so I didn't feel a lot of pressure. But oftentimes, oh, she's a girl. right. But I, you know, and so, but oftentimes now looking back, I I feel like, God, I was so lost. You know, I felt like I, I was just really bad at adulting in, in my early twenties, which, you know, kind of makes me think about one of the things that really struck me in, um, still distracted, uh, which is such a great book. I, I'll go back oh, and properly you. introduce it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know you've written a lot of books, but I do have most of my questions, I think, are for this, you know, aging with ADHD in the older generation. But one of the things you talked a lot about in the book was having adult children and that failure to launch as an ADHD, you know, older generation having adult children and some of the unique struggles that exist with, you know, having older children. And some of it just reminded me so much of myself in my 20s. And it was I had this real light bulb moment thinking about how a lot of you know, I'm terrified of retiring, I'm terrified of getting old, a lot of the fears that I have about aging, I think relate very deeply to the the whatever trauma I hold from my lack of adulting skills in my 20s, the fact that I was so bad at finances, the fact that I made so many impulsive mistakes. And so, you know, all of the stuff that felt like is very ADHD in terms of how people stumble through experiential learning. Uh, I definitely made my mother cry a lot, um, you know, but I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense as to why so many of us are terrified of, you know, aging and getting to that stage where, you know, um, we need might maybe need to be taken care of, or I'm not sure what actually what I'm trying to say right now, but it, it felt very fascinating to me to listen to that kind of generational relationship with, um, uh, you know, some of the, I guess we lose trust in ourselves as adults when we have ADHD a lot of the time. Maybe that's what I'm trying Absolutely. to say. Absolutely. And I I wrote about this in the book, Still Distracted, but I, I think it's really important to think about that one of the periods in which we struggle the most is very early adulthood because we've been surrounded by some level of support and structure because of school, because of parents, of living at home. And then that gradually or suddenly goes away. And there's just so much to learn if you think about it. It's like we didn't plan this very well, that we're supposed to figure out how to manage money and how to drive and how to feed ourselves and how to maintain a household and what to do for a living and how to get up on time and how to get to bed on time so we can get up on time and we need to change the oil in the car and we need to pay the bill and we don't we it's all too much mm -hmm. at once and i've worked with so many parents advising them let's do divide and conquer let's give your kiddo a gap year to learn adulting skills 
while they're still at home and then let them go out into the wild blue yonder of what so often American college life is like and uh, be much better prepared. And, and sadly, I've worked with so many families where they went off as a freshman, failed, came home with their tail between their legs, then learned the adulting skills, got a job, whatever, and went back and succeeded at college. There's just too much on our plate to learn all at the same time. And I think what happens as we face retirement is we are, again, facing the loss of support and structure. We Most of us have a built-in social life at work. Um, having work gives us a purpose and a structure to our day and a time to get up and a time to be there and a time to come home. Um, and all of that goes away. And at the same time, we're going through interpersonal loss, through death, through illness, through people moving away. I mean, my husband and I are still in a house we've been in for a long time, but nevertheless, we are losing friends because they're moving to live near their adult children, or they're moving south to warmer weather, or they're ill, or they've died. And so even if you stay put, your world is going to change a lot. And and one of the things that I talk to so many older adults about is the whole concept of addition and subtraction, that life is going to subtract things from you. And you need to very consciously add things to your life so that you don't end up alone and very isolated and and structureless. I mean, I think we're really at risk for social isolation and depression. And I've talked with far too many um, people living alone that are kind of living in chaos, you know, living on cheese and saltine crackers and staying up half the night because there's no reason to get up in the morning. And we um, need structure and support. I mean, those that's the drum I always beat structure and support at whatever yes. stage of life. Yeah, that's something I feel like I definitely am trying to instill in my children because um, I have a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old. And, <laughs> you know, not only are my husband and I kind of having in that panic mode of like, okay, we have to teach them everything they can possibly know about adulting before they leave the house, knowing full well both of them have ADHD so I know that full well they're not going to remember anything we say until they have to experience it themselves right so part of that part of that is going to be uh you know falling down flat on their face a few times before they learn their lesson and that we will be there to help them and pick them up but a lot of the time it doesn't matter how many times you teach them um something by explaining I feel like both of my kids are the type of people who really need to experience it and that was definitely my I was exactly the person you were just explaining before I went to first year university as a freshman dropped out said this is not for me I can't do this lived on my you know went traveling and lived took a gap year grew up in a, many ways and then came home you know came back and and got back into university and was on the dean's list for the next three years so <laughs> um but anyway the uh oh gosh the um oh the add and subtract that was really interesting to me because i you know i just turned 49 and i was just talking to my personal trainer about like i'm at that age where physically emotionally like there's so many things in my life where i'm like do i fight this or do i accept it and lean in <laughs> right um and i i really like that philosophy of like yes things are going to my body's going to be stop going to stop doing things and my body you know things are changing obviously but what can i add in you know, what can I focus on that I'm adding in as a result? Um, so yeah, I, I like that. Um, okay. So let's backtrack a little bit to the book. Cause I know you've written, uh, you know, about a dozen books for women and children. Uh, but your most recent one still distracted after all these years really focuses on a the aging population with ADHD. So you decided you, you reached out and interviewed how many, 150, 150, 75 men, 75 women, and um, Attitude Magazine was so helpful to me in letting me publicize through talks I gave for Attitude, 
uh, through other venues through Attitude that I'm looking for adults over the age of 60 that are already officially diagnosed. They don't just think they probably have it. Mm -hmm. Officially diagnosed because I wanted what I learned to really have credence, to have legs that, you know, she didn't just talk to a bunch of old people who think they might kind of sort of have ADHD. And, and it was really interesting what I learned. The great majority of them take stimulant medication, the great majority, and benefit from it, even though um, the great majority of psychiatrists that I come across don't want to treat adults over age 60. They've got no training. They're worried about medication side effects. They don't know how to address the possible cardiac risk. Well, the way you address that is you send them to a cardiologist and, you know, make sure that you have the cardiologist okay, that you're going to put them on stimulants. And it's so ironic because if anybody knows about geriatric psychiatry, many, many very old people in nursing homes take stimulants prescribed, not because they're requesting them, prescribed by their geriatric psychiatrist because it gives them energy. It gives them some focus. Otherwise, they're just slumped in their chair in the day room of the nursing home all day long. So it's so ironic that there's this gap that if you're 87, we'll prescribe stimulants for you. Not because of ADHD, but if you're 67, oh no, that's too dangerous. <laughs> Uh, well, it feels like the, yeah, it, it feels like there are so many stereotypes around the medication and the disparity between, you know, who you get as a clinician is, yes. is so interesting. Like your daughter had a pediatrician in, I'm guessing, you know, the seventies or eighties when was the mid seventies. So she had a pediatrician who not only recognized ADHD in a girl, but, you know, <laughs> Um, even in the set, I mean, even just recognizing it from, from her physicality, right? I mean, I would have thought at it that was, time, um, he it was shocking. Said, it, yeah. I, that was just pure luck, just pure luck. And so Very, I'm always fascinated when I hear, you know, the, I think the two things I hear the most from menopausal or uh, postmenopausal women who are seeking a diagnosis is the you've made it this long what what's the point that seems to be the most common response that they seem to get which is well who cares you know if you have it or you don't what's what's the big deal which i want to get to in a minute, minute but then the other one is just the lack of information and knowledge about stimulant medication and just the immediate dismissal of like no we're not even going to try that um based solely think, on age. Think about it. Can you imagine a psychiatrist saying, well, you've been depressed this long. What's the big deal? No, I'm not going <laughs> to treat you for depression. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> they would never say that. It's, it's this complete lack of understanding about ADHD. And yes, we can live with ADHD, without being diagnosed and treated for it. But if you look at the statistics that Russell Barclay's research showed, we pay an enormously high price for untreated ADHD that uh, I think not enough people know this yet, but our lives are eight to 10 years shorter than the average person's if we have untreated ADHD. And the reason for that is um, twofold. One is that many people uh, die a very untimely death when they're young because of impulsivity, because they drank too much and drove too fast because they decided it would be really fun to, you know, ski the back bowl where there was an avalanche because that, you know, and they just, um, I, I have a nephew with ADHD who I'm sure has significant brain damage at this point, simply because he doesn't ask anybody to hold the ladder when he's climbing up on the roof. He, I mean, he just isn't a careful person. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so our lives are shortened by impulsivity in the beginning of life. But even more importantly, our lives are shortened 
because it really takes a lot of planning and discipline and persistence. I mean, you were talking about that in yourself as we get older to get enough sleep, go to bed on time, exercise regularly, eat a healthy diet, know how to manage our stress. That what we're learning is that so many of the diseases we die from are lifestyle diseases. And people with ADHD are more likely than the average American to lead an unhealthy lifestyle, meaning um, eat too much, struggle with obesity, disordered eating patterns, um, sleep problems are existing throughout life. And when we get older and when we are overweight, then we're more likely to have sleep apnea and have very disrupted and non-restorative sleep. We don't get out there and exercise because everything hurts because we have inflammation in our body from eating too much starch and sugar and, you know, all the unhealthy things that we tend to ingest. And it's a lot harder for us with ADHD because it takes a lot of learning and planning and follow through to shop for fruits and vegetables. I mean, my daughter jokes that, you know, she throws out more than half of the fruits and vegetables she buys because she has great intentions, but, you know, then it gets to the end of the day and I'm tired and I'm going to order out and, you know, into the fresh bin go the good intentions. Uh, Right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I know I, I, gosh, uh, you know, I think one of the things that when you were talking about was, uh, we talk about this a lot on the podcast. I certainly experienced this in my life, um, which was this idea that like, as women, I think clinicians, doc, you know, usually it's our general practitioners, but there's that sense of saying, well, this is just how life is, right? You go to your doctor and you say, I'm depressed, I'm struggling. Uh, I have a baby and I, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I need help. And they put you on an antidepressant. They say you're depressed and they're like, well, this is just motherhood. Right. Or, you know, and the same thing happens in perimenopause. I, you know, I can't remember things and I'm, you know, really struggling and my emotional, I'm raging at everybody. And they're like, well, this is just perimenopause. Here's an antidepressant. (laughs) And so I think so many of us had a really difficult time, like gauging whether or not our struggles were more or less than what should be expected of us. Right. And, and, you know, I think once you realize it's ADHD and you step outside of that paradigm, you're like, well, no, any amount of struggle really isn't okay. Um, you know, we're all being kind of minimized as women, but I think that, you know, for me, especially it was really difficult for me to acknowledge that the, how I was struggling was more than perhaps the average neurotypical mother or wife or woman. And, and I think also the, um, no, I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry. Uh, but you know, I think one of the things that you were talking about ADHD struggles being sort of minimized or dismissed as that's life. What, Mm -hmm. what are you complaining about? And it's so interesting. I always try to capture little phrases when I'm talking to people uh, that, you know, just are the essence of part of the ADHD struggle. And I was being interviewed a couple of months ago, and it was a radio call-in show. And and interestingly, almost everyone that called in was in their 60s or older, even though that wasn't the topic. It was just general ADHD. And one woman was in her 70s. And she said, I have ADHD, I've been diagnosed, I've taken medication, it's really helped me, and my doctor retired. And now I cannot find another doctor, I'm in my 70s, who will prescribe to me. And they're saying the same thing that you were talking about. What, what's the problem? You're retired, you know, why do you need to take this stimulant medication? It's not good for your heart, blah, blah, blah. And the phrase that just really struck me, which I thought was wonderful, is she said, you know, I, into the telephone, I need my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, the battle cry, I need my brain. <laughs> I need my brain to function. And I think, I think women's complaints get minimized and dismissed. I mean, we, there are just countless studies for 
all kinds of medical issues, not just ADHD. But older people get dismissed. It really is ageism. Like, almost, what do you need a brain for? You're retired. You're old. Uh, as if we don't lead lives. And I'm in my late 70s now, and I am very active and plan to stay very active. And I, I wouldn't appreciate anybody going, well, what do you need to do that for? Just sit down and have some ice cream, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. That, you know, another thing that I really, really struck me um, in the book was was talking about the social isolation as we age and how deeply that can affect people with ADHD. Uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, it is often difficult for us to make friends. And sometimes I have these moments where I'm like, God, if I, you know, if I were to, I have to be nice to people. This is such a neurodivergent thought. I'm like, I have to be nice to people because if I'm not nice to people, nobody will come to my funeral. And then I'm like, well, why do I care if anybody comes to my funeral? I won't be there. <laughs> but this idea that like, I have to, make friend like I have to have a lot of friends it's been one of those things I've had to come out to you know you come to peace with as I've aged which was like I'm I only have a very ha small handful of really really close friends and I'm fine with that it's great but there's like I think a lot of pressure on us to um you know have a larger social network especially as we get older and so I'm always paranoid or I'm always worried that you know once my husband if my husband dies before me or if he leaves me you know what am I going to do how am I I'm going to feel so socially isolated and you talk a lot about that in the book just in terms of ways to manage that um with ADHD especially for many of us where like retirement homes and some of those typical situations like even you know the villages or those retirement place you know retirement communities might fiscally just not be an option for a lot of us uh, ADHDers don't tend to retire with a lot of money in the bank a lot of money exactly <laughs> so so can you talk a little bit about like some of the strategies that you mentioned in the book when it comes to um taking care of ourselves socially yes and you know i i really feel and i, I I'm always writing a book, so um, I'm working on another book. Uh, my writing partner, Pat Quinn, who also has ADHD. Yes. Um, another dream I guest are, of mine. Very on <laughs> she's wonderful. So she and I and a male author, amazingly, uh, a fellow named Michael Morse, who is on the staff at my clinic, uh, a psychiatrist, are writing uh a new book on women with ADHD because our book came out over a quarter of a century ago and boy, is it out of date. So um, the working title of our book is You Don't Know What It's Like. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is really the way so many women feel. Like you have no idea what it's like. The, I read a hilariously titled book I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. And it was written by a guy uh, who's a writer. And his wife is some bigwig um, TV personality in Canada. And so he followed his wife to Canada and he's Mr. Mom. And she's got the big career and he's fine with that. However, the title of his book, which I loved, is called The Unmade Bed. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. I'm willing to be home with the kids, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not even going to try to do it the way women try to do it. I don't care if the bed's made. I don't care if I'm feeding kids peanut butter sandwiches six days a week. I just don't care. I'm not that my self-esteem is not tied up with having a tidy, tidy home and, you know, providing perfectly balanced meals. I'm just here trying to keep everybody alive. Uh, while I write my book, The Unmade Bed. <laughs> and I thought what liberation he feels in his role, because of course, uh, gender role expectations don't require him to send out the thank you notes and you know buy all the perfect gifts for the birthday parties that his children are invited to. Uh, 
Whereas I've known many women, perhaps you have too, that will go to Whole Foods and buy something and put it in a pan as if they'd made it to take it to the school, whatever, because they feel they're supposed to have made it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead. But getting back to what you're saying, I really think that one of the best ways to help women with ADHD treat women is in groups that we help heal each other. We heal each other by understanding each other and supporting each other and laughing together and not expecting perfection from each other uh, as we feel the outside world expects of us. And it's, it's crazy the way women are living. I mean, somebody did, and I'm not talking about women with ADHD. I'm just talking about women that in this generation and the generation before, women are expected to work full time and they're expected to raise a family and they're expected to manage a household. And I'm of the gen, I was the first generation of working women. So my mom, my mother-in-law, they were home full-time. They played bridge in the afternoon. They told us to go out and play. I mean, they they were not killing themselves. Uh, and then, boom, we were liberated. I mean, I'm not so sure if liberation is the right term for it. Um, but societal expectations placed on us females today are ridiculous. And yet we buy into it. And yet we buy into it. You know, I have a wonderful uh, woman who's worked at my clinic for six years now, and she just had her first child, uh, who is not even three months old yet. And she was calling apologetic that I know I told you I was going to come back after three months, but I'm not sure that I'm going, for God's sake, stay home as long as you're able to. I mean, please don't come back if you don't have to. Come back two days a week. Come back, you know, whatever is going to work for you. Don't put that crazy pressure on yourself. And yet we do. So I think well, we, women, we don't have a lot of us don't really have that choice, unfortunately. Well, in the you US. know what? She, she and her husband, I think, made a very smart decision. They lived in a tiny apartment. It was just they were just a couple, and they talked about buying a townhouse and you know getting ready for a baby. And they just decided, no, we're not going to do that because we don't want the financial pressure. So they didn't do all that hoopla of what we have to have because we have a baby, you know. And I think that's why she does feel that she has more wiggle room to not come back to work full time immediately with a three month old. But getting getting back to what do we women do as we get older you know, that my mantra is structure and support, structure and support. And I think that one of the best things that Chad or ADA or any national organization could do is to help women create a network of support groups. You know, if if you had your cohort of five or six women that you talk to online once a week, uh, and could contact in between if you were really struggling. I'll tell you a story. When COVID hit, um, we decided at my clinic that we were going to offer a whole bunch of online support groups just for free. Just if if you need help, if you're home trying to figure out how in God's name am I supposed to work from home and have my children at home going to school and all the insanity that we all lived through. And so we started lots of online support groups. And I and my oldest colleagues started a support group for older adults with ADHD. So that was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And we met once a week. And that group still meets. And it's 2024. And it started in March of 2020. And that group still meets. I've, we ran it for about a year and a half. 
and I said, I'm so sorry, but I, you know, many things pulling at me and I can't continue to do this every week, but I really want to make it possible for you to continue. So let's talk about the logistics and let's talk about what it would cost to get your own dedicated Zoom room so that you're not in this crazy situation of, oh my God, it's going to turn off in three minutes because we've used up our 45 minutes. And one of the women in the group, a wonderful woman, she was a retired college professor, said, I'll take care of that. I can do that. You know, I've taught online. I've done things. And they're still meeting. They are still meeting because those women, interesting bunch of women, and interestingly, every one of them significantly creative, which we don't talk enough about uh, in terms of ADHD. I'm, they were writers, they were painters, they were sculptors. I mean, it was remarkable. And they would come and show in the group online what they'd been working on. I was just amazed. They're still meeting, and I bet they continue to meet for years because it gave them exactly what they needed, which is a place um, of humor and acceptance and encouragement and information. I mean, they come to that group with, did anybody see this article? I'll share it with you. I mean, it, it was a real support group in uh, all the good meetings of the word. And I think that's what we women with ADHD need is that place where we're okay. Yeah, it's true. It's absolutely my favorite work to do is is working in group coaching. And also one of my favorite things I've done in this business is, is I've done virtual book clubs where it, we study Sari Solden and Michelle Frank's book, The Radical Guide to Women for Women with ADHD. And, you know, there'll be like 50, 60 women in the Zoom rooms and we'll go into these small group private rooms and to see them when they come back from those private rooms, because a lot of these women, it's the very first time they've ever talked about ADHD with anyone, much less other women with ADHD who get it, right? And just to see them, yes. everybody comes back and they're all flushed and they have these huge smiles on their faces. And it is the most rewarding thing to see, to be able to like bring those women together and to, and to make those connections and have them find each other, right? It is so much about finding this community and, and embracing it. Um, well and said. yet, if you if you do research, which I do all the time, on studies about what are the most helpful treatments for ADHD, nobody's looking into that. Nobody's yeah. thinking about it. They're just talking about, you know, this type of therapy administered individually. Is that more effective than this type of therapy? Is that more effective than medication? I'm going we're missing the boat here. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. There's a, there's a TikTok account. They have millions, plural of millions of followers. Um, and I don't know where they live. They live in the South somewhere, but there's like a senior house where it's like, they, there's like six of them that all live together and they make TikTok videos about, <laughs> about their fun life living together. Um, and so that was, I found that really great, you know, talking about this rise in, like basically having roommates as a, as a senior citizen with ADHD, it felt so perfect just in terms of like, what, you know, how we can take care of ourselves, but not be left alone. Like you said, as many of us tend to do, um, you know, and have that more formalized. Cause I think a lot of us really struggle with like reaching out and remembering to keep in touch with people. And so one of the things that's great about those zoom, you know, those, the, those formalized groups is that it's being arranged, you know, even my, my best friend from university, we've known each other for 25 years and she's now living in Mexico. And like, we just have a schedule every two weeks, we check in with each other and we have a zoom call and we know it's in the calendar and it's like, we book it before we oh. Get oh, off the call wonderful. because we both know that that's what we need, right? <laughs> uh, we can't, we're not going to remember if I, you know, it'll take us months to actually get in touch with each other if we don't have this like in the calendar. Um, and so there is something that's really helpful about that formalized socialization too for us, I think. Um, so yeah, it's, I gotta, re I gotta look up who that TikTok account is. I'll put it in the, in the episode. Oh, that's show wonderful. So and funny. I would love to know too. And I will be willing to bet you that several of those women have ADHD. 
Oh, of course, right? I mean, you know, who, what, do you do, what do you do in your free time? I'm going to create a TikTok account and get millions of followers. Of course, they have, probably all do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And see, that's the side of ADHD that not nearly enough is written about. Mm. You know, and you were talking about the incredible energy that you feel when you go to conferences. I think that is universally true but you won't hear a single researcher talking. Well, I think a lot of us feel shame around that playfulness, right? That childlike energy that so many of us have, the childlike curiosity. I think so much of it, for me, for a long time in my life, that was something to be ashamed of. I didn't feel like an adult. I think a lot of people with ADHD have that feeling like I'm not very good at adulting. I'm not, there's something about me that is irresponsible, right? So we start to label a lot of that childlike energy as with negative labels. Um, and that, you know, and that's going back to what you said, like, I think that's why reframing is such a huge part of this diagnosis for us that we can actually feel so empowered, uh, and why so, so few, so few of us find an ADHD diagnosis to be pathological, you know, for, for so many of us, it's, it's a wonderful identity to embrace. Absolutely. And it is a type of a brain. And there's, there's no type of brain that is wonderful at everything, you know. So what is pathological depends on, you know, who's doing the defining of it. I just, I gave a tongue-in-cheek lecture on attention surplus disorder at a conference. <laughs> I had discovered this new crippling diagnostic <laughs> entity called attention surplus disorder and I developed a checklist you know I must keep all my ducks in a row I enjoy sorting socks I mean I'm just <laughs> um yeah absolutely <laughs> Uh, well, especially, you know, sometimes when we call that neurotypical, we're like, is it so neurotypical? I think maybe there's, you know, I think there's more, maybe there's more neurodivergence out there than we ever want to admit. Um, well, yeah. years ago, when I was in graduate school, this very famous um, lecturer from MIT came down. I, I graduated from the University of Florida. I grew up in Florida and got my PhD there. And they have an excellent medical school. And this fellow was brought down to lecture to medical students and the clinical psychology students that were being trained in the medical school. His name was Hans Lucas Hoiber. And he's really kind of the father of the field of learning disorders. I mean, we, we didn't, in those days, there was no such thing as a learning disability. And we were just beginning to understand a little bit about dyslexia, except we thought dyslexia meant seeing everything backwards, which, of course, is not what it is. But anyway, he came down, and I'll never forget his opening statement, because it, I think it has framed the way I've worked in this field forever. And he said, our brains are as different as our faces. Mm -hmm. That we have two eyes and a nose and a mouth, but we all have a distinctive face and we all have a distinctive brain. And I guess you could say there is a typical face. I mean, uh, often a typical face uh, or a desirable face is um, very, very balanced. You know, so it's, um, there's, there's nothing, it's a Barbie face in ways, you know, uh, but almost nobody has a Barbie face, I guess. And I'm, I don't want to look like Barbie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I thought that was such a good way of putting it because I find, especially because ADHD is defined as a medical condition and the way we do medicine in the United States and in many countries is medicine has to do with what's wrong with you. And so I think of ADHD as a type of a brain and not as a pathology. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking about this 
25 years ago at least at a conference and being scolded by some of the biggest names in the field don't go around saying that if you say that it's not a disorder then we're going to lose all the funding Mm -hmm. to study it and we're going to lose all the funding to support these kids in school it it is a pathology it is a medical condition and what i would say is that this thing we call adhd really isn't a categorical condition it it exists along the spectrum like everything you can be very depressed or a tiny bit depressed you can i think everything uh, exists along a continuum and certainly there are people that struggle mightily and you know practically you know can't find their head if it wasn't screwed under their shoulders but most of us with this thing called ADHD don't function that way. It exists along a continuum and that's true for autism. There are some autistics that are mute, that can't function without a constant caretaker, but the vast majority of people on the spectrum lead very functional, in fact, sometimes highly, highly successful lives, i.e. Bill Gates. I mean, he's on the spectrum. Lots of very successful people are. And so we really need to get away from this pathological notion. It's a type of a brain and it and the characteristics are variable and they exist along a continuum. And for I think for many of us how we feel about ourselves really has to do with where we are planted among whom we are living, what we're trying to do with our lives. I went to lecture, uh, oh, I don't know, this must have been 10 or 12 years ago, in Switzerland. And a group of private schools in Switzerland wanted me to come and talk to them about ADHD. The Swiss, if you can imagine, couldn't be a more ADHD intolerant culture other than the Japanese, I think of those two as the, you know, we value being hyper controlled at all times. So I was in the uh, cultural museum in Zurich. Uh, I gave myself a couple of days to get de jet lagged before my talks, and I walk into the cultural museum. And right in front of you, as you go in the door, are the Swiss national values. This is what you're supposed to be like if you are Swiss. And I created um, an acronym so I could remember it because I thought, this is brilliant. I love it. This is so related to why you don't want to live in Switzerland if you have ADHD. And the acronym is PPAD, Precision, Punctuality, Order, and Discipline. These are our national values. So I was contacted by this desperate couple. They had a teenage girl going to private school in Geneva, and she was just having the most miserable experience, and they moved her from that school to a boarding school in the mountains. She was even more miserable. And they, their father was American, and they just decided, we've got to get her out of Switzerland. I mean, her life is so miserable here. And her godparents, close, close friends of her parents, lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And she'd known the daughters of her godparents who were the same age for life, basically. And she went and finished high school living with her godparents in Arlington, Virginia. And that kiddo, who was being criticized and excoriated up one side and down the other, goes to a very good competitive public high school in Arlington, Virginia, becomes the class president in her senior year, has the lead role in the school play. I mean, she just, she could be herself. She could be expansive and everything she wasn't supposed to be when she was in Switzerland. And I I tell that story because how we feel about ourselves has everything to do with how the world around us responds to us and that it's it's so important 
to not stay in toxic relationships and we, we don't get to pick who our family is. And sometimes our family wants us to be utterly different than we are. And I always say, I, w- I was so blessed to have the mother that I did. She was just, you know, you'll grow up eventually. <laughs> And so these women that are having such a good time and, you know, being roommates, you know, in their later years have created a world in which they can thrive. Yeah. And I think to whatever extent any of us are able to do that, that that is one of the most important ways to live well with this kind of a brain. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, now, I quickly, I wanted to ask you about the uh, Advanced Training Institute that you're working on now, because um, I actually, I've gone back to school for somebody who dropped out of university the first time around. I'm, I'm now back, um, going back to school to become a mental health counselor. And so one of the things Wonderful. that fascinates me, thank you, uh, but what, you know, it fascinates me how much ADHD is not talked about in the curriculum. And I feel like I see it everywhere, every case study, you know, it's like every Every case study, I'm like, well, has this person been screened for ADHD? <laughs> Clearly, uh, they seem to have it. Um, and so, you know, um, so it is amazing to me not only how much I can bring to this to the conversation in terms of, you know, um, what I'm able to sort of talk about in the classroom in the in the curriculum in terms of this other perspective that so many future clinicians just aren't getting out of the curriculum. Um, They're not. So, so I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I, is this a typical, you know, certification like the CCCP or is this, tell me about this advanced training Institute. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, It's something I've been thinking about for years and I finally decided this is what I want to do at the end of my long career is to be able to share what I've learned over all these years with other people because our training is still abysmal, which is remarkable because ADHD is so common. I mean, it's not a rarity, it's so common. Well, especially and yet, when you're talking about clients with depression. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. You know. You've got it. Mm-hmm. So I am starting the Advanced ADHD Training Institute. And the reason I'm calling it Advanced is I really want to work with people who are already working with people with ADHD, not people who don't know anything. And we're starting with going through the DSM diagnostic mm-hmm. criteria. Mm-hmm. And I want it to evolve and grow and expand. Right now, I am working on an introductory lecture series on diagnosing and treating ADHD. And the lecture series will be filmed starting in April. Uh, I'm working with a company that is providing us with an online platform that is used by a number of online universities. So it's, it's set up to sign up for courses and pay for courses online. And I think it's just going to evolve. I mean, obviously, it can't all be me doing the training. I'm going to certainly do training around older adults because I'm the only one that seems to have done a lot of research in that. But I'm also going to bring in lots of people in the field that have a specific interest because ADHD is very complex. It impacts every aspect of our life. It has, uh, it exists with almost every other type of disorder you can think of. So we need to have training in ADHD and eating disorders, ADHD and substance use disorders, ADHD and autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the intersection of ADHD is enormously complex with um, the statistics are, and I bet they're low, that 80% of adults with ADHD have at least one coexisting condition, if not several. And my bet is it's higher than that. I think it's extremely rare to have ADHD and not have 
a learning disorder or an eating disorder or anxiety or, or, or a criminal record <laughs> or a um, criminal record yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and so i'm starting the training institute and the beginning of it will be my introductory lecture series and then we're going to develop tracks and those tracks will focus on the treatment, for example, of children, dividing it up between girls and boys, because I think that the manifestations of ADHD in girls are different. And in many cases, the needs of girls are different. We're going to have a whole track on treating women. We're going to have a track on every major comorbidity and invite people that really understand how to work with people that have ADHD and disordered eating patterns and substance use problems because there's just such enormous lack of information out there. And I really want this to become something that just continues to grow. And yes, there will be certifications. I'm because it's cumbersome and costly, I'm not going to be offering continuing ed credits in the beginning, although we probably will offer them. Um, basically, you have to pay a lot of money to a company that goes to all the trouble to mm -hmm. keep updating the certifications. It's, it's a, a cost matter, and I can't afford to do that until we've got students coming in. We've already got a lot of interest from people in many different countries. And of course, they're not concerned about continuing ed credits. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what it that's what it is. And it's it's basically going to be advanced training and how to diagnose and work with these these many, many folks. Wow, amazing. I mean, yeah, I'll be first in line as soon as I graduate. <laughs> I mean, well, and, um, you know, thinking about a case study we had recently in um, in one of my courses, it was a woman who was a high school teacher who had recently retired and was having difficulty with lack of structure in her life and was getting depressed and crying and over, you know, doing the dishes. And I was like, it's everything about this case study is screaming ADHD. Uh, but it goes back to that idea of like you were saying of like how important structure is in our lives. Yeah. And so there are going to be certain times like babies and our 20s where that really gets in flux. And I think retirement is a huge time in our lives where we're having to reevaluate our sense of self-worth and our sense of purpose. And um, I think it's so important that you are putting a voice to this and, and putting this research out here and, and speaking to a lot of a lot of these fears, but also, the, I mean, there's a lot of really, really helpful strategies in the book too. So Thank you so much. And thank you for sitting down and chatting with me. I really enjoyed this. Oh, I've enjoyed it tremendously. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much for inviting me and good luck with your studies. And I'd be delighted if you join us at the Training Institute. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. Okay.